Hey, Snackers, this is Kareem. Hey, everyone, I'm Matt. Welcome to episode 122 of Snack Minute. Today, we're going to be talking about another spooky topic <laughs> in our cybersecurity month of October, um, managing uh, secrets and keys uh, with Barry. Uh, Barry, why don't we jump right into it? What are, what are you going to be showing us today? Yeah, today I'm going to be uh, talking about managing keys and secrets, um, or I should say managing secrets and keys, which is the title of a course in our free learning path on Cisco U for the Dev NAE. That's our network automation engineering uh, learning path. And this course is um, part of that learning path. So everything I'm going to be talking about today, as far as managing your secrets and keys and your uh, you know software development projects and whatnot, um, it could be all uh, learned in, in this uh, free course. So I'm going to just jump right into it and hit on the, you know, probably the most common topic as far as managing keys in a project and managing secrets in a project. You never ever want to ever hard code that into your code. Um, it doesn't make the code portable and whatnot. Um, so you want to use something known as like a .env file. And these .env files can basically allow you to store your, your keys as strings um, and other information, not just, you know, uh, you know, API keys and stuff like that or passwords, but also perhaps uh, URLs and usernames. What's the nice thing about that is that, yeah, you can use um, some applications allow you to use like a command line argument. But the problem of using a command line argument is that you don't want to type your password into that um, command line because what's going to end up happening is that it's saved in the history. So if anyone gets access to your terminal, looks at your history, they'll see your password and your credentials, clear text. One of the nice things about using a .env file and some of the methods that we do discuss in um, the course is that you can have different .env files depending on the project. So, you know, you can have a .env file for, you know, your dev, your prod. So if you're changing your keys or passwords or whatever key value pairs, that's, you know, um, something that is easily uh, you can go back and forth. And this, again, as I talked about just a few moments ago, it makes your code much more portable as long as you're not hard coding something in there. It makes it more secure. Now, um, there are some drawbacks of .env files that we do have. Um, they're uh, very limited in their syntax. They're basically just a key value pair and they're just saved as strings, you know, so you can't, you know, really do much more with it, like what you could do, like with a uh, um, a .ini file and whatnot. Uh, but um, one of the nice things uh, that .env files also do is that they're very simple to use. But one other final drawback, and the most important one, is there's no encryption on it. So if someone gets access to your project folder and they, you know, log in and they, they're in that project folder, they can easily just, you know, take a look at that uh, .env file and they'll see everything in clear text. So it's not like saving something in like HashiCorp Vault where your your um, it's encrypted, your your secrets are encrypted. So someone would have to have a key to, you know, unencrypt it. It's it's all clear text. But I mean, they have to access your you know your project folder in order to do that. And if they already have access to your system, you have bigger problems anyway. So. <laughs> Not to mention what one of the things like you, you just had on on that as a bullet is your uh, having it in Git. So if you accidentally forget and push that code out to Git, your .env file is there. So you kind of yeah, didn't yeah, do anything. Might is, as well hard code it in your in your code. That is a big one, and I'm glad you brought that up, uh, Kareem, because I, I wanted to just show um, everyone real quick what you need to do in order to make sure that you don't automatically push that out. Um, I actually do two different things. I mean, obviously, the most common way is having a git ignore file, and then you just put your .env in there, and then it's not going to store it in Git, right? So if you make any changes to this file, it's not going to do that. One other thing that I do, because you might – now, normally, I don't forget my uh, .git ignore file, but if, you know, just in the case that you may, um, one of the other things I do – is that um, I create a, in my home directory where my Git settings are, I create a uh, .git ignore global file, and this does it across the board. So if I don't have a .git um, ignore in my project, this has covered me across the board. So these are files I know I'll never, ever want to save. I'll never, ever want to send to uh, 
um, you know, GitHub or, you know, GitLab or whatever, you know, uh, version control system I'm using. So this is, this I, I recommend. Um, so that is an excellent point because if you don't, you forget to do that, you're going to end up, uh, you know, sending all your credentials up there. So, all right. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, to get back with, and I'm kind of glad we talked about that too, Cream, with the, uh, the, uh, .emv files and Git. Usually with um, config parser and .ini files, those files generally you do want to send up into Git because generally those are, it's not recommended to use the .ini for secure settings. Um, usually what um, it's used for is uh, various smaller settings on your application, like, oh, I want to set my log severity to uh, debug, or I want to store a uh, certain output in this, you know, in this directory, or, you know, I want to change my settings for dev or prod or something like that. So generally you're going to um, use the .ini for that, for that. It's also uh, human readable. It's very easy to use. It's broken up into sections, so it's easier to organize. Um, it has some other features. The config parser library has a bunch of features that give it more functionality than you would normally have in the .env. .env is very vanilla. And then the drawbacks, same thing as .env. It's not encrypted, so you don't want to put anything um, that's sensitive in there. And if you are putting something sensitive in there, you don't want to push that up to your um, your, your repository. And uh, sometimes the features that are in the .ini are overkill for what the project you're doing. Like if you just need an API key and that's all you're saving in your project, then having a .ini file might be a little bit of overkill for that. Um, and it is meant to be shared. So it's a way of managing your, your, your keys, but I wouldn't probably manage my secrets with that. I'd probably use a .env, which is gonna be the common way. But ultimately, if you're looking for a more um, robust solution, you're on a larger team, um, you're working with a lot of sensitive data, you're working with a lot of different uh, endpoints and, and whatnot, uh, HashiCorp Vault is going to be your best uh, bet on that. And that pretty much encrypts all data at rest, as well as in transit back and forth to the application. It does auditing. It uh, allows for role-based uh, um, access so you can limit people's access to certain keys. It allows dynamic secrets so you can pretty much create a secret with its certain various plugins and then have that expire like maybe five minutes after you sent someone that secret. So there's a lot more uh, feature and functionality, much more highly secure, and this would be the mature solution for like a, an a, uh, enterprise and a team of developers. And with that being said, as great as all HashiCorp Vault is, is that there is a lot more overhead to it. So there's a lot more complexity in setting it up. There's a, um, a lot of uh, overhead as far as maintaining it. So if you got a small team, you're, it might be overkill. And there's other, other methods out there like that .env that might be more suitable for your situation. And Snackers, we have a tutorial on how to, for you on how to deploy and manage and, and configure HashiVault. So um, we'll, we'll drop the link somewhere here for you. Yeah, so uh, the so you have a um, with with HashiCorp Vault um, a lot more overhead, a lot more complexity. Plus, also if the server's offline, you know, and you only got one instance, obviously you're going to have HA and and a whole bunch of fail safes in there. But if you're you know you don't or whatever circumstances it is, um, uh, you may not be able to do any development or utilize the application because the server is not accessible. And then there's also um, various uh, software as a service features and costs that may be involved depending on what you're using for that. So at any rate, um, I'll just give a real quick overview example of what a .env uh, ENV file looks like really quick here before we run out of time. Um, let me bring it up here. So what I have here is this is what a .env file looks like, right? It's uh, very, very straightforward. Um, what we have here is we're, we're looking at basically just a bunch of uh, string data, um, and that's all a .env file is. And then the way it integrates with your application um, is that I use a package called .env, and you put in the method uh, load.env. And what this load.env does is it's actually going to load in your um, 
uh, your .emv file into the application. And then you can access it. There's a million different ways of accessing it. And I could spend 30 minutes discussing on various methods. But uh, the way I like to do it is I'll import the uh, built-in OS module. And then from there, I'll use a method called uh, Environ. And the reason why I like this method is that when you're when you're using this method, if the if you forget to put the, um, that particular uh, key in your .emv, uh, it will uh, the um, how can I say it, the uh, the application will fail, and I'll just say, hey, key's missing, and it's easy. It won't give you this weird traceback. If you um, get .emv. Uh, what will end up happening is that it will fall back to none. And then the traceback, depending on what it's using and what your default is set to, the traceback may be a little harder, especially with a NetMiko script like this. But as you can see with this basic NetMiko script, which just logs into the sandbox, all it, I have everything uh, set up in here so that I'm, I haven't hard coded anything in with my credentials. But as you can see, as I'm running the script, I don't have to put in any credentials into my into my application, and then in my code there are no credentials in here as well. So that's a uh, that's an excellent uh, way of making the application secure, portable. Um, you know, if I give it to any anyone else, you can simply just go in here, change the router name, uh, the username, and the password to whatever your suitability is, whatever you're using, and, and run it from there. But I'll put this all on GitHub. This will be available on GitHub for um, our uh, you know students out here to mess around with. But definitely check out that free course on our free learning path. And um, yeah, yeah, thanks for having me on, guys. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, Barry. Thanks for uh, thanks for showing us um, you know some of the the easier ways to to manage our, our secrets and keys. Um, uh, snackers, check out all of the uh, awesome uh, security re related uh, uh, material that we have on Cisco U uh, during this spooky month of October, uh, our cybersecurity month of October. And uh, we'll catch you guys next week. Thanks, Barry. Thank you, Snackers. Thank you. Thank you, guys.